We're super excited to let, uh, to bring Anita on board, um, you know, part of our bigger marketing series today, talking about uh, strategic com uh, communication. So uh, Anita has years of experience managing big brands across AI, tech, finance, and lifestyle businesses. Um, she's currently the chief marketing officer at Umpol and Medbox uh, Pharmacy, where she's been defining and executing their marketing strategy, target audience, and channels. Uh, Anita is also a wonderful resource in the startup community, uh, an absolute joy to work with. So, uh, Anita, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. Um, we have a really exciting session today. Uh, I think one of my favorite things to talk about is how to get to know your customers better. And one of the best things a startup can do is really know their audience. And this is going to be a nice um, extension to what I've already shared in the last two uh, sessions. So uh, let's get into it. So we're going to be covering a lot of content today. <laughs> so um, if you have questions, please drop them in the chat and office will be monitoring them and I'll drop in as well. Um, he'll flag me if anything comes up and I'm here to answer and be a resource for you. So we'll be chatting about audience insights you know, talking a little bit more about like specifically looking at how um, segmentation and communication can work for SaaS companies, but for everyone as well. Uh, then we're going to learn how to dig into data to get the information you need, we're gonna flow into storytelling and brand consistency. And we'll do a couple of case studies and then we'll talk about how you can develop your own multi-communications plan. So thank you for the nice intro, Anafis. Um, I'm Anita. I have worked in tech for a little bit now. I feel like it's in my whole life. And for those who know startups, it becomes kind of your whole personality. So <laughs> I think like, you know, for the last few years, I've really been kind of living in a space where I've lived, eat, eaten, and breathed tech and specifically marketing. Um, I've worked with um, companies from Starting, I started my own companies. I worked with companies uh, being a third employee all the way up to number 50. Uh, I've also worked all the way up until series A companies. And now I'm working as a fractional CMO and I'm doing a lot of mentorship with LiSpace and trying to give back as much as I can. Uh, I really, really love talking about this stuff. So please connect with me afterwards if you have any questions. All right. So today's talk is uh, number three in a series of four. So we've already chatted in session one about positioning and messaging when you don't know your audience. Last week, we talked a little bit more about channels and how to pick the right marketing channels. Now that you know your audience, where do you go from there? How do you meet them where they are? And today we're gonna to be talking about strategic communications. When you have many different audiences, how do you talk to them and not lose or water down the efficacy of your message? And also how you speak to them correctly to actually bring impact. Next week, if you haven't signed up for it yet, please do. We'll be tying everything up with um, just a look at how you can track and measure the effectiveness of all the work you've done. So if you haven't uh, come for the first two, no worries. These are meant to stand alone. I will reference things from the other talks, but they're not fundamental to being able to engage in this um, current one today. All right. So first off, we're going to dive right into audience insights. What do your audiences want? Who are, who is your audience? Who are you speaking to? This is something I've brought up in the first and second uh, workshops. And I'm going to sound like a broken record all the time, but the biggest thing you can do and the best thing you can do when you're starting off building your marketing strategy, uh, no matter what stage you are, is to really understand your audience. So I believe understanding your audience and gaining audience insights is the foundation of strategic communication. So it is the cornerstone of anything that you put out there. It, you cannot build a strong marketing function in your company unless you actually know who you're speaking to. You can't really give something to the, any of your customers if you don't know what they need and what they want. Um, so when you're gathering audience insights, you're really trying to understand things like their desires, their wants, their needs, their challenges. Uh, you have to get to know them very intimately to be able to provide a solution potentially, right? Knowing them on a personal level can really make all the difference to how you engage with them and how they see you from the other end. So how do you talk to them? Where do you even start? We all know this is really important, but data is probably one of the best things you can start with. And even small amounts, small 
um, surveys, connecting with people online, seeing parts of groups, seeing problems and solutions, joining Facebook groups and seeing what people are talking about in that area can really be helpful as well. But leveraging data can really help you know your audience. How you connect with your audience comes down to how much you know about them and what data you collect and how you interpret it can make the difference between how you sell and how you connect with your audience. So I've always been one that takes all of the interactions that I have with my customers to, as a, you know, to, as data points in a bigger story. And we'll get to that deeper. I mean, there's a whole section on diving into data, but even at a surface level, just seeing how people respond to social media posts, a little vanity metric -y, but still good indicators. Um, things like comments, objections in the sales cycle, uh, identifying how people respond or share information when you're asking them questions, really important as well. And once you have data and you've started collecting this data, this is really, really gonna be the foundation of the next step, which is segmentation. You need to know enough about your customers to be able to make informed decisions about grouping and breaking them into smaller audiences so you can speak to them more effectively. So segmentation ultimately just involves breaking down any audience groupings or personas that you have further. So that could be based off of shared characteristics that include ethnographic research, psychological uh, research, uh, psychographic, uh, geographic, and behavioral. And there's several different buckets that you can tap, tap, tap into, but ultimately the goal is to get to know them as deeply as possible. So being able to break that down uh, will help you be more personalized. And I think everybody here knows, we are also consumers while also building brands and businesses. We've been on the other end. When we feel like our brands see us, and hear us and know us, it's more relevant and chances are you're more likely to convert or engage with that brand when you feel seen. That data that you collect will help you do that for your customers. So in summation, segmentation is ultimately just further breaking down any audiences that you have in smaller chunks and speaking to them directly to their needs, values, desires, and challenges. So, you have these segments, but you also probably have some personas that you've built. If not, that's okay. In the first presentation I did, I talked very, very extensively about personas. I think that they're a really great starting point for a lot of startups. I urge a lot of the founders that I work with to use as a starting point. I don't believe that they're the be all and end all. Uh, but for those who don't know what a persona is, the idea is to kind of, if you have an idea of who your target audience is, creating a structure around who they are and maybe mirroring that with something that's a little bit like a, a, a mock person where you're saying, you know, this is Bill, he's 45, he lives downtown Toronto and likes to, you know, play golf on the weekends. He buy, he works at a Fortune 5 company and he likes to purchase X, Y, and Z. So at least then you can see kind of certain goals, aspirations, ideas that this person, this fake person might hold. But I don't, I urge you to not, to not end it there. As you gather data, that person should become more nuanced. That's why gathering data and creating more segments is really important. The persona work goes hand in hand with your segmentation. And if you don't have an idea yet of who you're speaking to, I really urge you to do this work before you consider doing any data segmentation, because having a semblance of an idea of who you're speaking to will make the difference in how you approach the next little bit of stuff that we talk about. But I think once you have a good idea of personas and you start gathering more data and you start understanding your customer and what works, move over more to what I like to use, which is called jobs to be done, a jobs to be done framework or a scenario-based framework where you take what your product and your service and offering does and you actually put that into terms like you know, here's the role that my product or offering fulfills for this persona or this person, because I believe that people are more nuanced than just a flat static idea that a persona builds. So understanding personas is really important and having that before you get going is of, like is probably imperative for these next few steps as we walk through these slides. So we understand segmentation comes from understanding data and collecting all your data, but 
why why segment when you are able to segment you're able to tailor your communications effectively and personalization can speak volumes segmentation allows us to address the specific needs challenges and desires of different groups and help with making stronger connections so rather than wasting your budget, or maybe you don't have a budget at this point, or wasting your time even, just kind of doing like a broad stroke communication plan, it's better if you are able to target it specific to that audience or persona. So if you know that you have a, your general target audience is a Gen Z grouping, how, where do they hang out? How do they like to be spoken to? What types of values do they have? And how can you speak specifically to that group of people? You should also consider which channels are engaging, which is something we talked about last week. And also just to note, if you'd like to see the other videos, um, message Alina or Nafis after, they're actually um, online, the two other workshops as well. But I digress. Tailored messaging will make all the difference in how you connect going forward with your audience. And so, some of the best things come from segmentation because you're adding more nuance to how you're speaking to your audiences. You have increased relevance and engagement. Um, things feel more personal. You're actually building a bridge with your customers. You have higher conversion rates, which we all want, and you uh, get enhanced customer loyalty. Think about some of the best brands that you interact with or you buy from. Chances are you feel seen by them. Chances are you probably like something you're putting out there and you connect with it because somehow it just feels like they know who you are. And that comes from like data. That comes from the, them doing a lot of work just to understand who you are, your needs, your problems, and positioning themselves correctly in the right channels to meet you where you are. And so it doesn't also it's not one and done when you do segmentation you have to continually iterate so this is something that is going to run through everything you do along with your offerings how you position yourself your value props everything has to be kind of in a draft mode um you might learn new things about your customers market conditions might change but as you receive feedback and as you grow as a company you will need to continually change and update all of your customer segments. Also, I just want to flag, it's, it, segmentation is a very powerful tool to use, but you have to recognize as well, there might be some pitfalls in it. There might be um, data overload. You might have too much data and having to understand how to like parse through that can be a challenge. And there might be overlap between segments. And we'll talk a little bit more about how you can discern when there is overlap. But the one cure for that is focus and being able to pick one segment and focusing on that one. So when you segment, you reap great benefits. So email campaigns that are segmented uh, have 14.31% higher open rates. And this is a staggering number, 101% more clicks than non-segmented campaigns. Just showing that you know, personalization is very key. Um, and 77% of marketing ROI comes from segmented, uh, targeted, and triggered campaigns. So it really does impact your company's growth. And according to Bain and Company, businesses that tailor strategies to customer segments generate yearly profit growth of 15% versus 5% of the businesses that don't. So it is a strategic imperative. It will help your company grow. Um, it'll help build longer lasting relationships. Uh, as well, like if you're able to continue to provide value, this is one of the impacts of segmentation. If you can provide value over a long period of time, you probably won't churn as many customers. And the cost of getting customers back after you lose them is actually twice the time, um, two times the amount as it is to get a new customer at net new. So you might lose, if you don't segment and if you don't work hard to keep the customers and provide them value, you'll be paying double to get them back. So, you know, now we understand a little bit about, you know, why, you know, strategic communications matters for a diverse group, you know, gathering data, knowing who you're speaking to, and really utilizing segmentation to your advantage. Uh, let's kind of dive deeper, though, with a SaaS look. So uh, software as a service um, type of tech, I've worked a lot in this space. It's not, I don't think that these tips are necessarily only for the space, but a lot of SaaS companies face the challenge of communicating effectively when they have diverse customer segments. 
And truly a one size fits all approach does not fit anybody. Um, it, it really, really falls short to speak to the needs of the customer and the different profiles of people that you're speaking to. So let's take a look at how you can avoid spreading yourself too thin. So <clears throat> great, you know that you have maybe two or three different audiences and that's great. That means you have potential to sell to more people, but there is a challenge that comes with that. Will your messaging hit every time if you're using the same thing across maybe let's say three different audience profiles? Probably not. People probably not won't be able to see themselves in every message you put out there. So if you're able to thoughtfully segment once you have enough data, you can really hone in on one segment versus spreading yourself thin across many. And not all segments are created equal. The way to discern which one you dive deep into really requires thoughtfulness, um, understanding your business objectives, and understanding, you know, <clears throat> kind of enough data to make that assertion of where you're going to go in, like deep dive into. So you have to also go deeper than just service level metrics to you know, understand which segments will offer you the best ROI if you invest in them. So that includes things like annual recurring revenue, lifetime value, and engagement le uh, levels, plus many others. Now I'm going to introduce you to one of my favorite terms. It's called the beachhead customer. It's a little more of a military type term I like using, but the whole concept is, you know, you know, it's a, a strategic customer approach where it focuses on one customer that's your beachhead goal. You focus intensely on this beachhead customer where, you know, you serve this segment of the market knowing that they have a higher likelihood based off the data you collected, they have a higher likelihood of growing and converting and, you know, providing revenue for a long period of time. So this target group acts as a stronghold, you know, providing a base from which the business can expand from. So going deep into your beachhead customer, understanding everything about them and understanding all their quirks, challenges and messaging accordingly, and just focusing deeply on that one segment over time, and then growing from there is the goal. So concentrate your efforts on this initial segment and then tailor your offerings to them to meet the specific needs. And that will ensure a higher likelihood of success and customer loyalty. Once you have that down pat, then you can move on to the other audiences. And you can still talk to those other audiences, but make sure that if you have identified a beachhead customer, all your top line messaging, all of your main company messaging, stay on your website, your hero image, um, everything should speak to that beachhead customer. The rest of the audiences, you can find different ways to message to them. They could be on landing pages that are then pushed. You can draw traffic to via ad buys. You could do specific community targeted campaigns, speaking to those audiences. You're not going to forget about them. They're just not, they're not the ones that will be providing you with the backbone of your company growth at the beginning. So the foundational focus that you build with your beachhead customer will allow for optimized resource allocation and really paves the way for a more broader market penetration. Choosing your beachhead customer is, isn't just the first step in the strategy, it's the foundation. So getting that right will yield greater results across the board. And if you focus on this initial segment thoughtfully and gather data accordingly, uh, you can really another military <laughs> concept here, you can really command the market in the space that you're in the space that you're playing. Okay. So also just going to encourage if anyone has any questions, please drop them in the chat. Happy to answer. I know there's a lot of data and information coming your way. Um, happy to answer anything as well. So now that we know a little bit about segmentation and audience insights uh, and your beachhead customer, uh, I feel like there's like other words you can use for beachhead as well. You don't have to ascribe to the, that terminology, but the whole idea is just, you know, the focus you need to bring to segmentation is the key takeaway here. And now we can take a look, a deeper look at how do you get the data you need to determine who that beachhead customer is, how you segment, et cetera. And it's more than just, you know, um, simply collecting data that you need. It's identifying, you know, what is useful, what is relevant and building a story 
around that that will inform your entire customer user journey and your marketing uh, all the way up to your company's ROI. Okay. So to start off, you really have to understand, you know, where they play. You need to understand what channels are they on? Where is your customer? First of all, who are they? Where do they go? And understanding the back be background behind it. So if you ha already have a website that's producing a lot of traffic, you can use things like uh, analytics tools to see where people are coming from. You can take uh, use social listening tools like Hootsuite or Buffer and see when you're posting things, how people are interacting with your content. Uh, understanding the behavior, uh, which you can also see in Google Analytics, by the way, you can follow customer uh, journeys and user maps through tools like that. By understanding where they are, you can pick where you go to meet them. So it's actually a really good idea to start collecting data about where they find you, how they find you. Is it organically? Is it through links? Is it just, you know, you just have to get intimately acquainted with how they move online. And there's two types of data points that you can really pick. And this is called primary data. Um, typically it's either qualitative or quantitative. Qualitative is the why. And that's kind of more like, you know, you're talking about why people are doing the things they're doing. You give them space to share. You hear from their own mouth. It's, you know, interviews, focus groups, one-on-one -on -one user interviews. Um, this is really important. I think one of the things that gets overlooked a lot is and then I've seen this in a lot of startups I've worked at, we don't spend enough time talking to our users or prospective users. And then we think that we know what they want. And as marketers, we maybe put things out there or use words and terminologies that our users aren't using. So taking the time to actually talk to people that you're trying to sell to, having those touch points will make all the difference in how you market and the effectiveness of your messaging. So qualitative will help you get that. If you have the time to do it, um, when I used to run marketing departments full time, my months would be have a minimum of five, 10 hours of user interviews, one on ones with prospective clients, um, churned clients, uh, and even people that were outside of my the persona that we we're targeting just to know why. Like, why aren't you using our tool? Why wouldn't you use our tool? Right. So, understanding that other side of it as well. Qualitative is really helpful for exploring those deeper insights. And again, terminology, language, usage, all of these things. Tools you can use for qualitative could be, you know, Google Forms. You can have like more open-ended questions. Um, just even outreach and doing one-on-one -on -one calls, maybe with friends. Um, you maybe can put a call out on your LinkedIn if you don't have... Um, if you don't know yet exactly who you're talking to and start gathering data by just like sitting and talking to people and seeing what comes from it. I also use userinterviews.com. They have a really great structure for being able to find, you know, top of funnel or middle, any, any part of the funnel, actually, um, people to talk to that could be in your target market and they help you incentivize it. So if you're like, I want to just, I'll give you a $15 gift certificate just to spend like 15 to 30 minutes with me so I can pick your brain about the subject. You can walk away with lots of really great insights and like the why behind specific behaviors. And the next thing is quantitative methods. So that's more like a larger sample size, more about quantity. Um, it's a like, you know, there's more generalization and bigger, broader strokes of data here. So methods include surveys with closed end questions, analytics and experiments. Typically, when you have a big budget, lots of companies will spend money on hiring a market research firm, but you don't have to do that as a startup. You can, things I've done in the past are just simply putting together a Google form and putting it out there and asking my friends to share it and relying on a network effect. And then within that um, survey as well, asking certain things, if it's a very the very first survey that you're doing, you know, just trying to get as many people as possible to take it and asking things that might help you get clues as to initial segmentation, things like, you know, where do you get your information from? Um, what, what do you do with like for leisure activities, things like that to get to know the person in that nuanced way a little bit. 
And then what I also do with those surveys is I add a, another question at the end where I ask if it's okay if I reach out to them afterwards for a call, a one-to-one -one call. And depending on who responds and how they respond, I can then go and get that qualitative research. So it's kind of a, a two-for-one thing you can try here if you're looking for ways to cost-effectively reach out and get information and market research. And quantitative is really great for validating any hypothesis you have. Things might come up as well that you had no idea about. So be flexible and open to learning. So market research is really great because it helps you take that data and turn it into an actual strategy. So it helps you identify your customer needs and wants, which I've been saying is really important. It helps you then tailor your products and services to meet that demand, and it informs your strategic decision making. It also helps reduce risks from a business context because you can make safer bets. Uh, specifically as uh, early stage founders, a lot of people don't have time or resources to do in-depth things like this. So identifying what's worth your time is really important and doing that, doing a little pre-work to see, doing that research and taking that data to inform those business decisions can help you make be better use of your time ultimately. And with market research, you have to also take the time to learn to interpret the data and the feedback that you're getting. And then from there, you're able to identify opportunities for engagement. And we'll go a little bit more deeper into this, but that type of those opportunities and the things you should be looking for include things like recognizing patterns, uh, trends, the pain points that might come up that you might hear on a call. Like if you're, I don't know, I think about the brand Sheertex and the tights that they produce, which are like um, indestructible. So one of the pain points that they might have found when they were doing some market research is that people struggle to find tights at a good cost uh, price point that don't rip. So they're able to identify that lots of people might want this. And that became the crux of their marketing, that this is a massive pain point, which I mean, it's kind of a no brainer, but I'm pretty sure they did a lot of testing also to make sure and validate that that uh, messaging worked with all of their diverse audiences. And we talked a little bit about primary research. So there's also another cost-effective way for you to gather data as a startup um, founder, or even if you're just like interested in doing this sort of stuff. And I'm sure if you've already pitched your company or have put together information in a business case, you've already tapped into what was known as secondary research, which includes, you know, already existing research that's out there to help inform trends or for you to identify market opportunity. Um, it involves a summary collation and synthesis of existing research rather than you going out and getting that data. So you can get secondary research from industry reports, academic papers, online databases, and which the number one thing I think of uh, is competitor analysis. Competitor analysis is really great to even just start off with, see where your competitors are playing. That's secondary research. Use tools like SEMrush or RFs to see what landing pages are working um, for your competitors. They have all this data. You can see where they're spending their ad dollars and what terms they're looking for. These can also give you like hints towards where you should be playing or to fill out that picture of that persona a little bit more. All right, so I mentioned this earlier as well, tons of free tools out there to help you uh, gather data as well. So Google Analytics, ones like Hotjar, which is a heat map tool, which uh, you can put in the back end of your website and you can see how people navigate through your website and add that to the customer journey discovery that you do. Um, you know, there's a bunch of different social media native apps, that, um, native data analytics tools that you can tap into as well, along with, like I said, a lot of SEO-based tools like SEMrush, um, Moz, and RFs. These are all really affordable. And, oh, yes, Alice, absolutely. Um, I'll make a list of all the tools, and um, Nafis will email it out afterwards, no problem, along with the deck. So... All of these tools are available. Um, they also have free tiers, so you can test them out. Um, get, get, you know, just test, like play around with them, get your hands dirty, start understanding what different data sources you can pull. Pulling them together and creating a whole picture is really important. All right, so 
now that you get the data, you have to actually do something with it. So you have to really, it's it's a big practice. It's like, it's not enough just to say, oh, I'm gonna spend the time talking one-on-one or I'm gonna put out this research survey. Now you actually have to like roll up your sleeves and be thoughtful about how you take this data in and you know the story you build around the narrative you build around it. You don't have to be like a data scientist to do this effectively. I'm someone that's a little bit allergic to data and analysis, but over time have learned to love it uh, because I've had uh, really good teachers, but also good tools to lean on. Um, ultimately, the best thing you can do to begin with is you have to really be clear on your why about why you're doing this. So what are your objectives? Clarify your goals um, before you can even like get to parsing through the data you collected. Um, you have to know what you're trying to achieve with the market research. So like ask yourself, like, why, why am I doing this? It'll help you focus in and then also tie it back to your overall business goals. So what are your revenue targets? Are you trying to get into a new market? Are you trying to gain awareness? Um, are you entering a new province? Uh, maybe you're shipping to a new country. So all of these things, like understand very clearly what your goals are um, from like a, a macro, a micro to ma macro level as well. Also make sure to set KPIs. KPIs could be anything like, you know, just trying to understand, uh, I guess, um, how many, if you're, I guess, like with data, you could say like, uh, at the end of this, we're going to end up with an understanding of, you know, this one target market or pick three channels that we can really target because we take in this data and we know that our target audience plays in this area or they frequent social media or uh, specifically Instagram, or we know now that we can spend the time to build the content, like a content hub, because our target audience really trusts brands that spend time educating people on their product. So setting up some KPIs around like higher level things, like we're going to walk away with an understanding of, you know, maybe channels um, and, you know, do they like visual heavy things or we have at least, you know, an idea of two segments. So put some numbers to what you're trying to achieve. From there, you can start segmenting. Now that you have a little bit of an idea of where you're going to go, you can start, you know, taking all of that data and putting it into meaningful groups. And I have brought this up a couple of times already. So some of the groupings could be demographic, ethnographic, you can look at customer behavior, product preferences, start segmenting based off of that. Say that you're a beauty brand and you're like, we want to launch this new product. Uh, it's for dry skin. We know that people that live in Southwest Europe, America might be the best people for that because um, the geographic location tends towards drier skin. Or we know that we're going in Canada, winter, people need something to nourish their skin. We have a dry skin product. We know that these groups age 35 to 45 through the data have this issue with dry skin. So during the winter, we're gonna plan this campaign. So being thoughtful about connecting the dots that way. It'll help you give you more nuanced analysis when you start breaking things down. Uh, from there, you start analyzing your segments. You can do them individually. Once you have some semblance of like a good segment in place, maybe several, you can look at them individually and put them against each other. Look at each of them like separately and understand them for the unique characteristics or responses to the data that you've gathered. And then you can also look at them together to understand like where is overlap? Where isn't there overlap? What's the very big difference between these groupings? This type of data, it's going to be really helpful for when you're actually implementing the marketing campaigns. Uh, it could be like, okay, this group says they they use this word to describe, you know, what they do. One of the clients I work with currently, it's a B two B fractional consulting uh, worker marketplace. So people like me, I'm a fractional marketer right now. Um, this platform helps match them with companies. So. Basically, we have two target audiences, consultancies and agencies who are recruiting. One uses one type of word language and the other uses another type of language. So through data and research, we've identified those words and we know that that's as far as the overlap goes. We make sure that when we look at the segments, we do not allow those two to um, overlap because the messaging won't resonate. So those are the type, there's some 
comparisons and things like that that we see that are the same, but we really highlight things are different to make sure that we can keep them separately. All right, and then look for patterns and trends. So, you know, now look for like things that are the same across all these segments. Search for consistent patterns, trends across different segments, data sets. And these repeating patterns can be really helpful in identifying like broader market behavior or preferences. And this can then help uh, focus your tr strategic planning. Also note anomalies. These outliers in data can be really, really great for providing um, insights that you might have not thought of before. From there, put all the data in the contextual space. Like this will help you understand the market a little bit deeper. And then you can put it against industry standards to see where you play. And from there, you draw conclusions, you plan your action, and we'll go deeper into how you actually can plan out your communications uh, strategy and continuously monitor and adapt from there. It's a lot, and especially if you've never done it before, it can feel like a slog, but there are lots of resources online and ways to attack this data to use it to your benefit. Because if you spend the time gathering, you should be able to take it and learn from it in the most effective way. So it should lead the way 100% and it will help you be clear about who you're speaking to. And take, keep going back, keep going back and reiterating things will change over time, especially uh, with the sense of being contextual. If, if market conditions, conditions change over time, you will also need to change. If you offer a new product, you will also have to change. Your segment might change. Their needs might change over time. You might even grow with your segments if your company has grown for a long time. So keep that in mind, be flexible uh, and aim for an iterative improvement over a long period. So it's, it's an ongoing process when it comes to marketing, because just like humans, it will change. Humans' behaviors change, our likes, our wants, our, our dislikes change over time. So you have to be almost in response to that all the time. So all that to say, data collection is not a one and done. You should be continually getting feedback. Maybe not to the depth of the first time that you do it, but over time, making sure that you're noticing signals and responding to those changes. All right, so another really big part of segmentation comes through with storytelling and brand consistency. So you're speaking to many different people, but how do you make sure that your brand is represented clearly and effectively across all of those different audiences, no matter how different they may be and their needs may be? So there's such a power and a strong uh, narrative and strong storytelling when it comes to brand. And in the first presentation, I spent quite a bit of time talking about why brand and brand identity is of utmost importance. It goes hand in hand with your target audience. And when you have a strong story that the thread runs through everything in your company and all the way down to your segments and how you message them, even when you have different segments, the brand essence, if it's strong enough, will always remain there. And you can, and that's by design. You can make sure that you're able to do tons of great marketing campaigns, but stay true to your core essence. So when you have a strong narrative, it really can transform your brand values, mission, and personality into really universal and unique experiences that resonate with your target audience. And like audiences from all different backgrounds, from all walks of life. And when that is coming through your brand, it ensures that every single touch point that you do can reflect that brand's essence and foster a sense of familiarity and reliability. That's where the consistency comes in. All right, and so when you can tie your brand and your core values together, you're setting yourself up for success. So really think back to the why about why you started the company, why you're doing what you're doing, and really bring that into your brand narrative and it should it should speak to your values and your missions mission. And is that innovation? Is that community? Is that sustainability? Those are all things that you should be imbuing through your entire brand, how you speak to people, your messaging, your um, positioning, imagery, even the photography you use. Uh, all of these things go back to who you are as a brand. And also, you know, actually show. Use these stories to show and demonstrate 
you know, all of these values in action versus just telling people. The best brands and the ones that we resonate most with have a really good storytelling structure. Okay, I see a, a little a, a message here from Alice. Do you think blogging is a good way for a startup to gather data and segment based on viewership and topics? Okay, or would you add a targeted survey worksheet questionnaire within the blog? What about analytical tools? Okay, so um, there are a lot of companies that do a really have used content marketing as a, a great way to start gathering data. Uh, actually, there is a case study I'm going to be sharing that dives into that a little bit, uh, and we can get into that a little bit more, Alice. But I definitely do believe content marketing and blogging is a great way. There are pitfalls given AI. If you're going to do it, you should be investing in good content. You should know as well a little bit about the problem and solution that so you can actually provide content that impacts your viewer, not just putting things out there for the sake of putting it out there. It won't, won't help your SEO and it won't build brand trust if you're just relying on AI. So really be thoughtful about how you do it if that's the goal and uh, make sure that you're distributing. So it comes with a caveat. I think I am a big fan of blogging. I think articles, education, everything is one of the biggest trust builders. And I encourage a lot of people to explore that when they're doing um, their marketing channels, deciding marketing channels. But again, comes with caveats, comes with upsides and downsides. You have to invest in it. And it takes a little bit of time and you might not immediately get the return that you need in a quick enough way to make a decision right away. But I think what you're th where your head's at is really great. So adding interactive worksheets, blogs, downloadables to lead to a lead generation page, things like that. All of this stuff is really great um, ways to see uh, how people interact with your content and see if it's relevant. So there's ways to do. I would really explore some content marketing and lead generation tactics if this is where your head's at. And uh Questionnaires are great. Pop-up and surveys are awesome on the website. They can be a little bit annoying, but sometimes when used correctly, a survey uh, to help direct your um, customer to where they need to get and self-select is great for them and is also really great for you to grab data. A good example of this is our brands, like let's say a skincare brand again, where you get to their website and before you can purchase, they force you to take a quiz about your ideal product or your skin type. Um, that is great for them because they can then personalize and cater to your segment. But then that's also great for you because now you have their information to get their result, the results you typically have to put your email in. So now you're building your list and you have this data on this person. So then you can continue to market to them based off of their preferences and the data you've collected. So Alice, I hope that answered a little bit of your question. <laughs> There's a lot of caveats. Um, and tools wise, the Google Analytics, I say is the first step, but there's a myriad of other ones out there for you. Okay, so now back to regular programming. <laughs> uh, so when you have a really strong uh, storytelling function, it speaks to things like common ground amongst people. One, brands that really can tap into uh, their audiences typically tap into universal shared experiences, feelings of like growth, ambition, ambition, Nike, you know, making like getting that race done, feeling like you're part of something bigger, um, connection, resilience, hope, bigger things that transcend boundaries, that transcend race, age, these types of universal experiences are all things that we want to connect with as humans. So tap into that, build that into your brand and your storytelling. Make sure to include diverse perspectives and different viewpoints and experiences from various demographics. This will really make you kind of um, you're more universal in how you approach and inclusive to many different audiences. And also be aware of cultural sensitivity. The glo more globalized our world is, uh, we have to account for a lot of this stuff. And we also have to be aware of the stuff that we're putting out there. Where possible, get a second set of eyes, work with someone if you're talking to different communities, maybe you know, talk to uh, people that might be experts in it before posting something. Because if you put something out there that might not be interpreted the way you mean, it could erode your brand trust. So just be thoughtful about how you do it. I'm not saying don't do it, just be thoughtful. All right. So. 
the biggest thing here though, if you're gonna take away anything is consistency. So universal experience is really important, but you have to be consistent. Consistent consistency even for any part of your business and your brand in general, not just storytelling. Uh, it, it actually helps foster a sense of familiarity, reliability, and build trust up over time. And it matters because it creates emotional connection over time. Uh, the stories really do tap into something that's just human across all of us. You know, it makes them more like all the things you put out there, those brand experiences more memorable, more personal. And no matter the audience you're talking, no matter the segment, having those that emotional connection will endear someone to your brand. It also is an opportunity for you to share your values um, these narratives are effective mediums to communicate brand values across various segments. And then differentiation. I think this is so important. It's a noisy market. How are you different from your competitors? Storytelling and consistency really help with that. Some of my favorite brands uh, do a great job of strong storytelling and branding and consistency, um, no matter how many segments they have. Airbnb, literally anybody could use it. And it's not just anybody within one market. It's people from all over the world, different cultural uh, backgrounds, different desires, needs, price points. There, This is such an interesting case because anybody uses it, right? Just like Warby Parker. Warby Parker is, if you're not familiar with the brand, is a direct-to-consumer glasses company. What I find interesting about Warby Parker is that they're just all about accessibility, and they also like giving back. And it it flows through their own experiences. And like I said earlier, many of you might be building based off something that's happened to you. Maybe there's an experience you had, you've noticed a gap in the market, et cetera. Warby Parker's founders, there's two of them. One of them was backpacking and his glasses broke while he was backpacking and he didn't have enough money to replace them. So he set off on a mission to make glasses and eyewear more accessible to anybody. And they become a massive brand because of it. And they're able to speak to, again, so many different segments, but the common thread in the story goes back to that experience one of the founders had. And another brand, Patagonia, one of my favorites, uh, and I'm pretty sure a lot of people maybe even own some of their products or clothing, but they have, care so much for sustainability and that is woven through everything that they do. And it's become a big hallmark of their brand and all over their website, all over their messaging, even in their imagery, like outdoorsy stuff, it connects you back to their main mission. So we're coming up to the end and there's a few more slides to do, to go through. Um, I'm gonna go through the case study and then I'm gonna open it up for some questions. Uh, we'll follow up with the deck afterwards. We have a whole section on how you can then implement your own um, multi-channel marketing campaign as well. So uh, we'll follow up later, but let's just talk about Gloss here really quickly. I love this brand. I think it's really great. Um, so Alice, to your point about blogging, Glossier is a great example of a company that actually used content marketing and blogging to understand their segments. So they went from a beauty blog, um, Emily Weiss created a blog online, started talking to people about like beauty brands, products, and then went from that after gathering data inadvertently, just sharing stuff that she liked took that data and actually made a $1.2 billion empire. So there are ways to use blogs and data to build a product and a company that's really successful. What I love about Glossier is they're a masterclass in speaking to many diverse audiences with authenticity and engagement. So they've identified their beachhead customer. They knew who they were speaking to, someone who valued authentic beauty conversations and community-driven product development. And then they went deep into that, developing a really strong loyal base. They leverage user-generated content and they turn their customers, who they invite into the conversation, they turn their users into micro-influencers, creating a viral campaign, basically. They did multi-channel engagement because they knew that their audiences were across so many different channels. They tried several different platforms, they tailored their message accordingly, and they found a lot of success through that because they built a lot of community and through that loyalty. So much so that 70% of their sales actually come from peer-to-peer -peer referrals. 
massive. And that's the goal. If anything, you know, word of mouth and referral is probably the best sales because it takes less time to convince people if you have a trusted source telling you that something is good. I think back at some of the best products I bought, I had to tap into my friends and my trusted, like my trusted experts in my life to tell me the best things to do. So when a brand is able to tap into that, it's golden. They also care a lot about continuous innovation and they are constantly taking feedback and growing because they have this built-in structure with their users and their consumers where they ask them and get feedback about all their products. They adapt based off of the needs, produce new products based off of what their clients and customers say. So their success lie, lies mostly in their ability to identify and deeply understand their beachhead customer as number one. Number two, they foster a community through authentic engagement and they leverage this foundation to scale their messaging across multiple audience segments. Okay, so I said we have a whole other section left to do, but unfortunately we're running out of time. So I'm just gonna open it up to some questions really quickly um, and we will share this slide, uh, these, this, these slides afterwards. Awesome. But uh, Fatima, I think you have your hand up. Feel free to jump in. Uh, hi. Uh, thank you, Anita, for your great explanation. Uh, just a, uh, I have a question regarding my uh, uh, advertisement in Instagram. I want to start with uh, with a budget, devoting a budget in Instagram advertisement, but I have no idea to start with which number. So do you have any suggestion for this part? I guess especially when you're starting off, I, I typically go on what I can afford. I think it's really tough. Unfortunately, it depends on what you're bidding against. Like without the data, I can't give you a really good um, base number to go with. So make sure that you see what you're like, what the market looks like and how many other people you're bidding against, or you're going to be competing against, because that will change the amount that is being spent every single day and your budget will change. So if you're in a highly competitive market with advertising, you will be expected to spend more because bigger players have the money to funnel into it. So your budget will really depend on how competitive your marketplace is. So I would suggest maybe looking at kind of that first, identifying, you know, how busy is my marketplace? How competitive is the space I'm in? And maybe even doing like a test budget to start off with, with your messaging. So make sure that you know who you're speaking to. And I always recommend that if you aren't a hundred percent on your positioning or your messaging yet, um, or your target audience, do a small spend and do a two week long sprint to just learn, do a testing phase before diving fully in. Okay. I need to onboard the restaurant, so uh, I want to be connected to the managers of restaurant. Mm -hmm. So do you have any suggestion for this onboarding? So if you're going the ad route, I think like all you can do right now is test to see if it works. I think I'm not sure if Instagram is the right channel for that. You're going to have to test to see that. There's also groups. There's also Reddit. There's a whole bunch of different ways and, uh, without really knowing the audiences, I can't give money much more than uh, what the response I just gave, unfortunately. So there's a lot of different data points that you can uh, check out. I think pick maybe two channels and test those first. That's my that's my suggestion until you know what's working. Have you spent time talking to restaurant owners yet? Yeah, I have started uh, in Instagram, but uh, didn't receive a good. Actually. Have you had like one-on-one -on -one conversations yet to see where they spend their time? Uh, do you mean through the channels? You so you know you can just outreach. Like I in the past would go and you know message someone and say, "Can I have like ten minutes of your time to speak to you?" Yeah, uh, like, yeah, I've started. Okay, that's great. And has anything come up from those conversations where you can get some insight into where, um, you know, Instagram? Are you for certain Instagram is the number one platform that they're on? Uh, because I see so many advertisement from restaurants and managers, so I, I was thinking that maybe it's better a good idea to reach them from Instagram. Because sure. someone that uses uh, the, these channels for advertising, they will uh, check their messages as well. 
for sure. So I would suggest just testing right now until you're hundred percent sure that that's the channel that they use. And in the meantime, I would try talking to some restaurateurs to see if there's other avenues, because I'm going to tell you like advertising and Instagram advertising over time will cost a lot of money. Um, especially restaurants, if you're doing marketing for restaurants and food and service can be pricey. So also kind of balance out the channel strategy that you're using to make sure that you're using your resources wisely. So, for example, do, um, instead of Instagram, do you prefer uh, hiring uh, uh, sales, for example, sales uh, representative to go and to do, for example, door to door marketing? Um, it depends on the needs of your audience. So it you'd have to do a little bit of research before you dive into hiring somebody. It could start off with, you know, maybe just you talking to people to start off with. So you, just even a few signals that this is the right way to go before fully investing would be my uh, suggestion. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no problem. So um, any other questions? We're at time. Um, my email is here. Feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn or on email. We will be following up with the deck and some resources afterwards as well. And please sign up for next week. We're going to be tying all of this up and looking at tracking and testing the efficacy of your efforts. Amazing. Um, Anita, thank you so much. Um, just couldn't thank you enough for all the information that you're bringing here. I know it's super valuable and insightful for, for all the founders joining in. Um, and yes, we will have uh, the recordings and decks available after. So uh, we'll create a follow up on that for sure. Um, and sign up to our uh, our uh, follow up session next week. So um, thank you again. Wishing everyone a wonderful rest of the day. It looks beautiful outside. <laughs> Maybe get some sun time out. Um, and uh, we'll see everyone next week. Bye, everyone.